<laughs> All right, you guys. Well, Rolf Potts, man, sorry to, to keep you waiting. And, and, yeah, thank you so much for making time to be here with us today. Um, how are you doing, first of all? I'm doing good. It's it's been a fun week, you know. Uh, Tim launched the audio book on Monday, and so um, I've been talking about you know vagabonding as a book and as a concept more than I have in years. You know, I imagine it's giving me so. wanderlust. So, <laughs> um, well, yeah. So hopefully, we should have a few people joining in, um, maybe possibly within the next you know 10, 15 minutes, if they want to come join us on the broadcast, um, but we've got at least about 30 people watching live right now. Um, but yeah, I'll start off with, you know, I've got a whole bunch of questions for you. It's been, I can't remember, but I want to say it's probably been almost two years since we first spoke. Something, Something like that, maybe even three. It's been, a, it's been quite a while, but it's a pleasure to, to see you again and be able to catch up. Um, but so, yeah, for all of you tuning in, for anyone who for some silly reason is not familiar with Rolf Potts, um, he's the acclaimed author of Vagabonding, An Uncommon Guide to the Art of Long-Term World Travel, and Marco Polo Didn't Go There, Stories and Revelations from One Decade as a Postmodern Travel Writer. And uh, you've reported from over 60 countries and written for, you know, all kinds of big online properties and magazines and newspapers and TV shows, uh, National Geographic Traveler, The New Yorker, Slate, Lonely Planet, Outside, The Guardian, on and on and on. Um, Rolf is an explorer who's really, I mean, you've, you've adventured across six continents, right? Um, and... Your, your first book was one that really had a, a gigantic impact on me very early on, and uh, so it's always a pleasure to talk with you. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for inviting me in. So, you know, just, yeah, like to start us off, where are you calling in from today? This is my home in Kansas, actually. I have a, I have a little house uh, on the prairie, I guess you could say, in rural <laughs> Saline County, Kansas. Which is great because it's there's the overhead and cost of living here is next to nothing, and so it's a great place to come back to when I'm not traveling and my family is nearby. So nice, you know. Well, that was one of my questions for you. Um, I find that kind of the more I travel, and and I've been doing the slow travel thing, like you talk about in in your first book, um, for the most part, you know, spending three six months in one place or even living in several different places now like Bangkok, uh, Chiang Mai, um, Krabi and now here in, I'm, I'm in Santiago, Chile today but um, I find that the more I do that like the less I have the traditional definition for the word home like most people so that was one of my questions for you is just out of curiosity has do you have a place that you still do consider home? It sounds like you do, but has that um, the definition of that changed for you over time? It has, and especially when I was deep, deep into my initial vagabonding journeys, you know, because everybody grows up with this sort of a sense of home that's you know tied into their family. But then I lived overseas. I lived in Asia for seven years, or various parts of Asia, living and traveling, and my sense of home got really abstract. Um, and so, you know, my story of, of focusing my idea of home is very unique to me. I mean, I lent my sister some money, and she, she used it to make a down payment on some land, and I was wandering around. I was actually thinking of getting a tattoo, like of leaves of grass, like Walt Whitman-style leaves of grass with roots coming down, about, you know, the idea that I take my roots with me. <laughs> uh, but around the time I was thinking of doing this, she said, well, why don't you just get, why don't you just get a house nearby us? You know, it's, it's Kansas. It's property is cheap. And so, uh, long story short, I, I now live a mile and a half from my sister um, in this great little, oh, you know, double whitish place that I fixed up myself. And just like those early days of travel when, you, when you're sort of <coughs> confronting the challenges of travel, confronting the challenges <coughs> of renovating a house really endeared me to this place. And so this is where my, my travel sense lies now. Uh-oh. I hope we still got you there. Give him a minute. 
shifty internet in Kansas. Um, <clears throat> anyhow, uh, just through experience and and coming to renovate a, a shabby house into a house that felt like my own, uh, gave me a sense of home that that is a lot more focused, you know. And so I can relate to your situation because I lived it for years and years. And there's a lot of pleasure in that. But it's it's nice to to have a home to come to, uh, home home to too. And because my family is so nearby, um, I don't really worry about my home when I'm gone. They can keep an eye on it. Yeah. Well, I actually spent uh, I spent the summer back home in California, which is the longest I've been home in five years. I spent about three months back there, which is always a, a nice opportunity yeah, to revisit with family and close friends and stuff. But yeah, my my definition has definitely changed. I just home is wherever uh, wherever the Wi-Fi is. You know, it's wherever I am, which is an interesting uh, way to live. Have you read uh, Have you read much Pico Iyer? He writes a lot about the idea of the, the portable home. You know, the idea that home is something you internalize, even if you're constantly traveling. Yeah, a little bit, but not not extensively. But you know, I was looking at uh, Tim. Tim shared a, a link today, I think, of some of your favorite travel quotes, and I noticed him in there quite a bit. And I really resonate with a lot of what he does say. Mm, yeah. Um. But you know, I, well, so one of the reasons why I was especially excited to to catch up with you again today, um, I mean, first of all, your book is fantastic, and I think you've got a lot of lessons to share. A lot of people who are new on this path, but uh, coming from my particular perspective, I also really do feel that there is um, there, there's a lot of similarity. I think in some ways between firstly between the world of a writer such as yourself and entrepreneurs but also in in travel and uh, you know long-term travel and just the life of anyone who chooses to kind of uh, follow their own path you know follow an unconventional path and I think a lot of entrepreneurial folks feel that way about themselves like they're on this un unconventional path um, so I mean but yeah I see so many um, indirect uh, similarities between those two worlds. Like for me, it's uh, it's become very natural. You know, building my own business and being in charge of my own time and, and geography kind of go hand in hand. Um, but I just I was really excited to get another chance to get on the phone with you after I think. You know, kind of the business side of what you do seems to have been growing quite a bit lately, and um, but just hash out some some interesting ideas, kind of about how those two worlds might might intersect a bit. Um, they have a lot in common, actually, because they're both they're both about improvising in the face of uncertainty. You know, about exactly m making a plan, but knowing when to stick with it and when to to deviate in, in interesting new ways. So. Yeah, uh, yeah, I agree. There's a lot of parallels there. You know, the, so when we spoke the first time through Digital Nomad Academy, um, I remember you telling us at length about uh, kind of some of your early travel. I think you, you you said you'd started early on with basically living out of a van and traveling around the United States, and how that had really helped give you the long-term travel itch. Um, but yeah, as to to maybe open up a, a conversation about, um, you know, the the purpose of what you do as a as a writer as a creator, um, but also how that integrates with your life. I'm curious, was there a particular pain point or challenge in your life at the time? You know, either before or after this uh, trip around the U.S. But, you know, I'm curious, yeah, was there a pain point that was kind of an impetus for you to start traveling the way you did? Definitely. I, I've thought about it recently. I in, in the summer of, the summer between my sophomore and junior years of college, I went back to Kansas and I was interning at a TV station and stocking shelves in a grocery store and running 10 miles a night. I ran track in college. Um, and so I was sleeping all day and I was awake all night doing all this work and I just hated working at the grocery store 
and I had a lot of time to think because it was the middle of the night. And the more I, you know, lined up cans of tuna and unpacked jars of peanut butter, the more I realized that any job that I didn't love was just going to be a variation of stocking grocery store shelves, you know, that so much of one's life is invested in professional pursuits. And I, and I just really became bothered by the idea that I might be, you know, I might end up in a situation that I didn't like. You know, I, I think when you're in that age, when you're in, in college and when you're in your youth and you're not sure what, what comes next, it's easy to, to really worry about, you know, sort of the received ideas that you're supposed to buy into. And so I, in some ways, Vagabonding became a letter of reassurance to my 20-year-old or 18-year-old self, you know, saying that you don't have to buy in to the, the insanity of consensus that American life puts on you and that you can align your life in a way that that is you know in in tandem with your dreams and so initially my idea to go vagabonding and live in a van and travel around the United States was just this way to to front load my retirement I guess I just wanted to have this amazing trip that I thought people had to wait their whole life for um, and then I could get travel out of my system and then maybe I could consent to maybe going into a career that would metaphorically be stocking grocery store shelves. And there was so much, this was pre-World Wide Web, actually. This is the early to mid-1990s. And so there was, you know, as a guy in Kansas and going to school in Oregon, there wasn't a whole lot of reassurance. I couldn't go on and, and Google travel out of a van in the United States. Google, you know, was six years from existing. And um, so I just... Uh, I, I, I guess there was sort of an existential heaviness that probably I wouldn't have to confront these days because there's more proof that people are doing it. But that really forced me into this idea of, of going out and doing it. And then once I started to do it, it's like, why didn't anybody tell me that this is so fun and cheap and safe and like all of the all of the fears that I was wrestling with turned out to be completely inconsequential. Um, and it was uh, it was just a terrific discovery, I guess. And in some ways, I've never really come home from that venture, you know, that, that idea that I could invest my resources into new experiences instead of some prescribed version of a life was this great discovery. Um, and I've been fine-tuning it ever since. Yeah. Well, one of the biggest reasons that the book spoke to me, so I first read Vagabonding. When I was on a plane to, uh, I, I went. This was probably six years, six or seven years ago. I was um, on a flight to um, from San Francisco to Spain, and I was going on a trip with three buddies for the holidays, and we were just doing, you know, a two-week trip abroad, um, and it was a great time. But I, yeah, I remember. Uh, just devouring your book uh, on either the way I think it was the way there, possibly the way back. But um, you know, it's just perfect reading material and for for flight. And and I'd been thinking about this trip, and as much as a great time as it was, uh, it it was eye opening for me to to go through your journey there, your realization. But it, yeah, it, it has always really spoken to me because your your focus. I, I feel, you know, a large part of it is about spreading that message that people can take control of their own circumstances rather than, as you say, be, rather than being passive in, in their lives. Um, and, you know, so I think it, teaming up with Tim Ferriss recently, you know, you guys put together quite a lot of great marketing material and uh, uh, one of the things you said, you know, as you call vagabonding an uncommon way of looking at life <clears throat> and how you choose to use your time or, or value your time. Um, so I'm curious, you know, it's probably been a long journey for you, but if you could kind of think back to the beginning, how do you think travel has changed your your worldview or your belief system, you know, from from who you were to start out with? Well, I talk in the book about how travel forces minimalism on you. It forces simplicity on you because you can't pack everything that brings you comfort at home. You can't pack your 
video game system. Although I guess increasingly these days with a smart with a smartphone, you can bring a lot of manifestations of home with you. But it forces you into an experiential mode. Uh, so off, so much of what we do at home is under the category of distraction uh, from reality or distraction of the core aspects of life. And travel doesn't allow you to hide behind those habits, or at least you know, meaningful, long-term, non-consumerist travel forces you to improvise. It forces you into new situations, and it teaches you that the best experiences are the ones that maybe start a little difficult or maybe make you feel vulnerable or foolish. And, um, and so it's just, I think, I think the lessons go hand in hand with the experience. You know, the, the form, the f the form of the journey is sort of um, what informs your life. And you know, there's a lot of journey metaphors in life itself. But um, I mean, that's a great thing for for starting when you're young. I, I was on a Reddit interview today, and somebody asked me about you know how I came into that mindset. One great thing about when you're young is that you don't have a lot of stuff yet. You don't own a lot of stuff. You don't even have that much money unless you're born wealthy or something. And so um, at a time in, in my life, again, back when I was in my early 20s, late teens, when I was sort of expected by society to, to reinvest my earnings into things, I, I just started investing them in experiences almost by accident out, out of this fear. And then suddenly I realized that why wouldn't I want to live like I did when I traveled the states and lived in a van and and just had these amazing experiences? You know, some of which were frivolous party experiences. You know, I was 23 years old, and and it'd be a shame not to party when you're just getting started. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, I mean, that led to philosophical realizations. And I and I say this when I go to colleges that um, that um, there. Sometimes in American society we have this this thing against fun, and I think it's because sometimes we we have fun in stupid ways. We have fun to escape. We party to escape our real life. But when you travel, partying is part of every day. You know, maybe you don't want to get completely shit canned every day, but the idea of going out and um, not every day, <laughs> right? But but of going out and mixing joy with your life, and and just again being in an exper in, in experiential mode uh, is essential, and that's. That's why another thing I thought about with the Reddit questions I got today was just like, trust me, just go. Just go to Thailand for a month, and that will teach you things. I, I could tell you things, but after a month in a place um, that's, that's receptive to travel, like Thailand, I always end up sending people to Thailand, and you spend a lot of time there. Um, yeah, me too. The, it's the, a good place yeah, to start. It's a great place to start, yeah. And um, that experience will teach you more than you could ever study in a book. You know, just being out there and and um, stumbling across experiences. So, yeah, I think. Well, and in my experience, you know, so when I first left the U.S., I mean, I I'd been very fortunate to do quite a bit of travel, but um, but at this point, this is the first time I ever moved out of my hometown, and I decided to move halfway around the world for whatever reason. I wanted to go somewhere as wildly different as I could imagine, so I chose Thailand to start. Um, but yeah, one, one lesson I relate probably a lot is just that uh, before actually doing it, you know, I, I did make it out to be such a big, big, immense uh, mountain of a, a challenge, for lack of a better word, in my head. But you know, once I got going, I it really just drove home the fact that uh, we are capable of adjusting to circumstances and learning and you know becoming much more self-reliant at, at, at a rate I think a lot faster than we realize you know until we force ourselves um, that's the biggest thing for me of, of travel and living abroad is just learning what you're capable of and and uh, learning a bit more self-reliance. Um, great lessons that it has taught me so far. Yeah, you know, one of, when you were talking, I was reminded of one of my interviewees for the new audiobook version of Vagabonding talked about how the decision to leave was way more difficult than the travel itself. Mm. And so I think, as humans, we're almost made to be in, in self-reliant improvisation mode, you know. We, we're descended from hunter-gatherers who, who made sense of the world on the move. And so it's, it's, it's so much easier than you think and more exhilarating than you think to just be out there and <coughs> doing it. So that's a good thing. Yeah. Hang on, I'm going to refill my water. I'll be back in a second.
Sure. <coughs> uh, let's see, Dylan, you want to unmute yourself? Uh, hey, Zach. Thanks for joining us, man. Um, why don't I have, if you're in here, if you can see that Hangout toolbox in the sidebar, if you want to leave yourself off mute and just kind of keep up with those and, you know, if there's something, if there's a good question that comes up, um, just, you know, in, inject when you can here and there. Is that cool? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, because I don't want to, I don't want to be too distracted by the comments coming in while I'm also trying to engage with you here, Rolf. But, sure. um, well, yeah, you know, in the past, uh, uh, on our past, I don't know where my video went, but uh, <laughs> on our past call, you know, we, we did dig into a lot of the details of kind of your approach to minimalism, for example, and um, a lot of tips you, you do have about minimizing the cost of travel and how travel really, really does not have to be as expensive as most people think. And and um, and your book goes obviously into much greater depth on stuff like that. So I don't want to ask you too many questions that I'm sure you've been asked all week. You know, you're probably really tired. It's coming up on the end of the week, and you're you're, you're I'm sure you've been working hard uh, promoting the new audiobook version. But um, one simple, straightforward question. I am curious because my my folks, my dad and my stepmother, after five years watching me abroad, they finally kind of come around to this idea and uh, they're finally planning a six-month sabbatical and a little bit of a round-the-world trip. I was just curious, you know, if when, when people ask you, how much time do you tend to recommend people take off for a round-the-world trip or a sabbatical? What do you think as opposed to the typical two-week holiday, um, what do you think is really necessary for like a transformative experience? Well, in the in the original promotional copy of the of the book, I sort of framed it with six weeks, you know, to 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 two months to two years, sort of thing, with with six weeks sort of being the short end of that. <clears throat> um, and I'm not going to knock people who can't even travel for six weeks. I think it's good to travel for for a week if that's all you can do and sometimes that can give you a taste and a motivation to travel for longer I don't think there's a rule of thumb you know in the UK they have what's called the gap year and I think a lot of independent travelers end up using a year as a as, as a as a benchmark in fact it's a lot of people take one year and they go around the world it's, it's very concise one year one planet you know um, but that doesn't necessarily need to be a hard and fast rule, and it really depends. You know, I don't know how old your parents are, but um, they might not be able to leave certain obligations for a year. And I think that you can have a lot of interesting experiences in two or four or six months, especially if you're not used to that sort of thing. Um, and you know, I've actually traveled with my parents since I started traveling. I've I've met them in various places, and I've gifted some travel to them. And I don't think we've ever gone any more than three. We, I don't think we've done a full month out there, but they still, I mean, they were able to soak in so much compared to how they normally travel that um, four, six, eight weeks can actually be a lot. So, yeah, I would say there's no rule of thumb. If you can do a year, that's a great challenge, you know, because a year definitely gets you out of your comfort zone. Uh, but if you can't live, if you can't do that at all, then uh, do it for six weeks. Do it for two months. Keep it in mind, of course, that if you travel for two months, just go to one country. You don't need to go to ten countries in two months. You know, um, um, you you can, but that that slow experience of one country is going to be so much more meaningful than the than the rushed experience. I mean, people assume that there's more value in going to more countries, but really, that there's more value in in staying in one country and getting to know it in, in a much more intuitive way. Yeah, I agree, and you know, I think. Um I'd had many experiences for a few days or two weeks, you know, traveling to certain places, but, uh, and that's still fun, but it's just, it's a wildly different experience when you actually do get to spend, yeah, two months, three months or more and really get to know what the local culture is like, you know, adjust to the food and maybe learn a little bit of the language, make some local friends, it's like wildly different. To me, that's that's a much more uh, fulfilling uh, thing to do. I mean, Short-term travel is fun too, but I, I've really fallen in love with this slow travel. 
Yeah, and you know, you mentioned language. I think that's a great example. Is that you go to a place for a week, in the middle of a eight week trip. If you're going to be in another country the next week, you're not going to force yourself to embrace the language. You know, you yeah. you you can study fifty phrases on the bus, but in another week you'll be in another language zone. Yeah. And so, staying in one place makes you confront things in in a way that just deepens the experience all the way across the board. Yeah. Actually, that's one of the reasons I'm really excited that I finally made it down here to South America because it's almost an entire continent of Spanish speakers. So while well, there's lots of very unique, you know, brands of it everywhere you go, um, I'm I am actually excited that it give me a good chance to, even though I'll be moving around, uh, it's like I get to keep practicing the same language rather than having to adjust to to too many. <laughs> Well, once you once you begin to tell the differences, then you'll know you're you're getting someplace. Um, yeah. I remember studying Spanish in Cuba and the Dominican Republic, and they speak such a mush-mouthed Spanish that you'll learn traditional Spanish, and you go in the street and you can't understand anything. And then I remember yeah. going to Colombia and Ecuador, and I could understand people, and I you know I felt like crying because I'd been studying Spanish for so long, and I felt like an idiot. But it's just that the dialect in 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 the Caribbean is just a really hard one to pick up. I hear Chilean Spanish is pretty slangy. Um, yeah, it's it's very quick, and um, I guess you'd call it slangy compared to mm -hmm. a lot of uh, you know more um, enunciated and clear to my ear <laughs> Spanish. But yeah, yeah, it's a good challenge, I suppose. Though I'm, I mean, I'm just I'm in baby steps. I, I'm actually pretty embarrassed that being originally from California, I never learned Spanish, but I learned French instead. But hmm. that helps a bit. It helps a little bit. But um, what what in your experience, like maybe language or maybe other things? Um, I was just I was curious. What are some of the toughest obstacles or adjustments you've had to make to life on the road? In your experience, language can be a big one. I'm pretty lousy at language. Um, I taught English in Korea for two years, and learned some great lessons there. You know, like as as far as pleasure, you send me to Asia, and I'm going to go to Thailand. It's just a more laid back place. But I really have important memories tied into Korea because that's where I sort of crashed up against another culture, and that's where I learned that that that's where I learned how to communicate without fully speaking the language. It, it, I I was trying to teach English conversation to these kids, and I realized the challenges that they were going through, and they knew a lot more English than I knew Korean. Um. And so I think I think those early lessons of learning to be intuitive on the road, um, to get past that initial level of culture shock that might tempt you to think that everybody is conspiring against you to make you feel like an idiot, you know, <laughs> get, getting past that paranoia of early of early culture shock, and learning to relax and in, and and operate intuitively in another country is important. And my crash course for that was Korea. You know, I was frustrated mm -hmm. a lot in Korea. And Korea can be as or more workaholic than the U.S., and I was working there. Um, but man, it was it was such an important two years, and the lessons I learned. I, I, I tell people often that be an expat at some point. You know that um, travel notwithstanding, go to a place and live there for a year or two, because yeah. um, the lessons you learn there are going to be essential, and they'll make you a better traveler, and they'll make you a better American if that's where you're from. And so I wouldn't trade my my two often difficult years in Korea for anything. Yeah, one of my cousins, uh, Jim, has been, he had been teaching in Korea, uh, in Busan, for I think six years. He's a, a university professor and he teaches uh, sound theory and sound design. But uh, wow. yeah, yeah. I lived in Busan, so. Yeah, he went out there and he fell in love with it. And then actually, I believe one of our DNA members, Gray, um, he told me at one point, you know, he taught in Korea and I think he was inspired by you, as a matter of fact. It, it's funny, I've I've populated Korea with a lot of teachers. <laughs> yeah, um, proudly so, um, because it's again it was it was so important for me, and I think yeah, there's a lot of people who read Bagbonding, and there's a a world full of countries to teach in, but they think well, you know, Rolf did it, so we'll do the same, and and uh, I, I hear from a lot of the Korea expats because um, you know we have a lot in common. Once you've lived in Korea for a while, you can you can read Hangul and you love the food and. It, it's fun to hear from those kind of people. Yeah. Um, something you said a minute or two ago reminded me, um, but I, I 
type down one of the quotes uh, from so Tim Tim Ferriss shared a link that I saw just this afternoon. It was like he said Ralph Potts' thirty-one favorite travel quotes. One of them in there was from Paulo Coelho from the Pilgrimage, and it says, "When you travel, you experience in a very practical way the act of rebirth. You confront completely new situations. The day passes more slowly, and on most journeys, you don't even understand the language that people speak." Uh, you begin to be more accessible to others because they may be able to help you in difficult situations. Um, I, I just thought that one was really a cool quote that you pulled out there, is a, you know just kind of addressing yeah the challenges that you face on a regular basis, the fact that it's easy to feel like you're just thrown into the deep end and you know you don't necessarily understand people, you don't understand their cultural norms, the way things work. But uh, I think that's such a huge learning experience, you know, that that uh, it's hard to get any other way. Um, yeah, I quote yeah. Bill Bryson too. He talks about how he, he reflects uh, Coelho's quote by saying that you're a kid. I mean, you, you can't even read the signs in some of these places. You know, you don't yeah. know if it's safe to cross the street. <laughs> um, and 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 that vulnerability is something that you lose when you're when you're no longer a child. And so suddenly you're you're back in a Experiential mindset that you're that you're not used to, but yet is a is a place as far as advancing as a person, you know, experientially and, and intellectually and and um, spiritually, um, being forced to be in that childlike state is is terrific. You know, there's 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 so much to be learned. Yeah, it's a uh, it is being forced into almost a rebirth. It's a uh, it's a. Uh, Hyper speed version of you know kind of emotional and personal growth, personal development. Um, but uh, I, I I am curious. Like um, we're we're down here in, in Santiago, Chile, working on I'm working on a um, with a group of people. They're kind of building an experimental education experience here called Exosphere and there's a, about 30 people who've come down here from all around the world to learn a bit more about entrepreneurship and business um, but it's also really really pushing everyone to uh, accustom themselves to a new place and new language and interact with each other you know so it's a lot of yeah personal growth um, I, there's, t there's kind of two questions in this I suppose but one is just yeah, I'm curious for your take on um, the value of just simply interacting with and learning from new different people and places uh, along the, the path of travel. But also, yeah, what are your um, what are your I guess general views on on education and and you know travel as a non-traditional educational experience? Um, well, obviously, I'm a, I'm, I'm a proponent of, of travel, in, in part because of the fact that it's unstructured, or it, or it is unstructured if you allow it to be. You know, people, these days, it's easier and easier to put structure on your travels. You know, I often say that trying and failing to write vagabonding, or trying and failing to write a book after my first vagabonding experience in my mid-20s, was better than grad school um, because I wasn't in a compressed program that may or may not have applied to me. I was trying to do it, um, and I didn't. And in, and in failing to write a book that anybody wanted to read, I learned a lot about writing books that people did want to read. Uh, and I think travel. Um, I've ended up talking a lot about this just because technology has able has been able to smooth out a lot of the travel experience now. You know, you can you can carry a GPS and a, crowdsourcing information tool in your pocket when you travel nowadays. Yeah. But that, that idea of confronting your own limitations and, and your own confusion and your own failure and your own frustrations, as a traveler, and of course you can learn to you can learn ways to manage all of those emotionally, but still it's 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 this very vivid and stimulating form of education where it's not a received education, but it's sort of a self made education. And you yeah. can follow you can follow your interests and passions in a way that a formal education doesn't allow. Um, and I, you know, my parents are teachers. I do teaching myself. But um, a lot of people ask me about, oh, you know, should I go into grad school? And especially writing grad school. 
And um, I say, well, live a little, you know. That, that um, the trial and error form of education um, with its, with its um, inherent uh, ability to make you confront your own failures and overcome them is, is a much more meaningful uh, way of education. And especially with your, when, when you're young, even if, if you set out at age 21 to become a writer and by age 28 you travel the world and you figured that maybe writing isn't your bag, then at least you've traveled the world. You know, you haven't wasted away in some college town getting a graduate degree or, or um, you know, trying something that's less dynamic than the travel experience. I mean, you use the word education, there's so many people who start traveling thinking that this is my passion, this is, this is what I'm interested in, this is what I'm good at. After two years of travel, they've completely upended what they thought they were good at because they've, they've left their home, they've left their comfort bubble, and suddenly they've found new passions and, and new um, areas of expertise. Um, and so just that, that great unknown that comes with travel is a, is a great... It's, the deliverables are vague, you know, but yeah. the, the, uh, you can't just promise, yeah, travel the world and you can come back and be a zookeeper or whatever you, it is you want to be, but... <laughs> You, you go off and you travel the world and something will happen. If you allow it to, you'll find something that you're good at. You'll find something that you love. And that's why travel is, um, is one of the best forms of education. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I was curious because, especially from your standpoint, you know, it's, uh, when, when we'd last spoken, I know you had just started teaching at the time, and I think now you're teaching nonfiction writing at Yale University, if I'm not incorrect. And, uh, yeah, one semester a year. So, so four months a year, I'm at Yale teaching nonfiction. Oh yeah, it's just like to me, had a few times. Like, I do think, uh, as an entrepreneur, as a business person, as a as a writer, like any that it's a form of art, and you're kind of on your own path. You can be taught, but you're also creating your own path. You know, and there's no rules, and um, it's hard to be given a template to follow, especially if you want to be good. It's like you're creating something. Um, and, but that's why, you know, I'm interested to have these conversations, and you're, you're someone who kind of comes from both ends of that, I, I think. Like, you're a part of a traditional education um, atmosphere and, you know, also a proponent of a very non-traditional kind of approach to education. Because another one of the, your favorite quotes was uh, Paul Fussell about uh, before the development of tourism, travel was conceived to be like study, and its fruits were considered to be the adornment of the mind and the formation of the judgment, and the traveler was a student of what he sought, and I, I really, uh, really believe that as well. You know, I think it's probably the best learning experience you can, that money can buy. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, okay, let's... We've got all kinds of questions flooding in, so Joshua asks, um, I realize Southeast Asia and South America can be inexpensive, but are there parts of Europe that might be less expensive for a location-independent entrepreneur? Anywhere you might recommend calling home for a little while? Yeah, well, um, the further north you go and the further west you go, the more expensive you go in Europe. And so uh, south and east are the ways to save money. Uh, in that part of the world. And, you know, Northern and Western Europe are great places, but it's just, um, it'll eat up your money pretty fast. So, um, places like um, Hungary, Romania, uh, maybe Macedonia or Greece, Turkey, for sure, if, if Turkey counts as Europe. Um, to an extent, I, I know, actually, I, I know a lot of people who, who live in, like, Ukraine and, and Russia and love it, Life is a little bit harder there. It's, it's a little bit more complicated to live in those countries. I'm trying to think of other classically inexpensive parts of Europe. Um, Poland, to an extent, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, East and South. That's, that's the way to go there. Um, yeah. and, and one recommendation, actually, if, if you're inter interested in being location independent in Europe, is to go there and just travel and, and just see which places you connect with. Uh, and then save that final decision for um, two, three months into the journey, because you might, you might, you know, go to Italy, which is probably going to be more expensive than Bulgaria, 
But then suddenly you've met these amazing people and it's a little bit more expensive, but it's a lot more connected to, you know, your own passions and, and your own reasons for being there. And so um, when people are making these decisions, I really encourage them to make those decisions out of the travel experience because uh, often those questions will be answered by the travel experience itself. Mm. I see Zachary's question here. Should I? Yeah. Well, he's on the line with it. Zachary, actually, I don't know. Let me see if I can unmute you. I can't. I don't know why I can't do that. But if you want to unmute yourself, Zachary, why don't you come on and share with us for a second, if you can. Send the controls up along the top, above the video. Well, give it a second. It did this for you, I think, too, Rolf, didn't it, at the beginning? Maybe it'll yeah, take it, it, for some reason. Yeah, you did something, and then I could unmute. I could, I could read Zachary's question and answer it. I can see it in the dialogue here, um, if you'd let's like him, to. Let's give him a quick chance, see if he can come on. But, um, okay. Let me see. So Matt was curious, Matthew, mm -hmm. what kind of van you were traveling the U.S. in early on. <laughs> Uh, a 1985 Volkswagen van again, and it broke my heart. They stopped manufacturing them this uh, last year, um, or maybe actually I think it's this year. The last vanigans are being made in Brazil, and they're going to stop producing them this year. Uh, and so, um, man, I love that. I love that vehicle, um, and it was it it it, it did as well. Hmm. Do you uh, do you ever still do like RV trips or you know anything like that cross country? I still love road trips. Um, I can't recall the last time I did an RV trip, and and the Vanagon wasn't even an it, it wasn't a camper van. I I still got the back couple of seats and built a bed and and had some bungee cord curtains um, for when I was sleeping at night so nobody could peek in. Uh, so I'm a big I'm a big road tripper, um, but not necessarily an RV guy. I did a little bit in New Zealand. There's a big camper culture there. There's actually a big camper culture in Europe as well. Um, but usually I like the idea of just road tripping with the car and then mixing camping and hosteling and, and hotel stuff. I, I did a little bit of that in France this year. So. Hmm. Actually, okay, so I think we've got Zachary on. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Rolf. Uh, you've been traveling for, for quite a long time, and I'm curious about how your travel habits have changed as you've grown older, or perhaps if they've changed. Uh, that's a good question. Um, because I think invariably they do. You know, you um, you experience places in certain ways, and they change. But then you also change as well, and your and your proclivities change as well. I mean, I I think I slept in a in like a, a horseshoe pit when I was traveling the United States when I was 23, and I probably wouldn't sleep in a horseshoe pit again. Uh, and I was just talking about this road trip I did in France this summer. Um, I rented a car. You know, I I uh, I did something that when I was a younger traveler I thought there's no way I'm renting a car you meet more people on a, on a train or a bus but actually in France where I was, it was it was cheaper to car for a week than it was to take a train from Paris to Lyon and back I don't I don't know why that is although I've noticed that the same thing in the United States is that it's cheaper to rent a car and drive than to get a Greyhound uh, so my travel habits have transformed as I've gotten older I'm less of a shoestring backpacker I seek out more comforts. Um, I've slept in, slept in enough hostel beds that I'm not going to, or bunk rooms, and I'm not going to seek it out all the time, you know. I've smelled enough, enough intercontinental dirty socks to last a lifetime. I'm, I'm not against hostels, but um, often I have the, you know, if I have the means to stay in, in a more interesting place or do a couch surf or something, then I'll, I'll seek that out. So, yeah, I, I think that's an exciting notion, too, that, you don't travel in the same way when you're 43 than when you do when you're than when you're 23, and then that's a good thing. You know, you always have access to that world that you're comfortable with as a younger traveler. But as you get older, uh, you can try new things. And one thing is that if you're lucky, at least uh, you you get more money as you get older. And so I have more of a budget to work with than I did when I was a younger traveler. And so I'm able to to do a few more indulgences. Um, and it's fun. How old are you, Zachary? Twenty-six. Twenty-six. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you're on the. You know, I got my first passport when I was twenty-five. Back in 
you could go to Canada and Mexico without a passport when I was when I was um, younger, and so I didn't get a passport until I was 25 when I was about to move to Korea. Um, and so yeah, you're on you're on the front end of the journey, man. It it it, it keeps getting better if you let it. Right on, brother. <laughs> thanks for your question. Thanks for, yeah, Thank thanks you. for joining me, Zach. Um, Vanessa was asking about uh, it was she she says she really enjoyed vagabonding. I know that I know her. She's down here in Chile as well. Um, she said it had a pretty profound impact on her as as well, I believe. But uh, she made the point that it's it, it's your ten year anniversary, I believe. This year, um, and was curious, you know, about any updates to the book. So I think we've got a story you could tell there. But yeah, tell, you know, tell us what what does it look like? Uh, Vagabonding came out in two thousand three. What do things look like ten years later? And what have you been uh, working on that, you know, is going to change the world this week? <laughs> <laughs> well, one one nice thing about being an established writer now is that I can you know, I can fart around a little bit, and one of my quotes in that slideshow is a Kurt Vonnegut <laughs> quote that says that we're put on earth to fart around and don't let anybody tell you any differently. <laughs> so I did an investigative piece for Sports Illustrated last year, you know, I'm, I'm teaching it at, a, at, at Yale, which is um, uh, a lot of fun, and, and it's funny, one of the questions was what writing mistakes did I make, what would I change? You know, when I was younger, I was frustrated that I didn't go to a more elite university, you know, I went to a little school in Oregon that most people haven't heard of, um, and I thought, yeah, you know, if I'd gone to a place like Yale when I was a student, then I then I would be successful easier. Well, in a way, it was a more interesting lesson to not start out with a lot of connections, and to to make those mistakes and failures that actually gave my career a lot of meaning. And so, it's in some ways, it's more fun as an old guy to come back and teach at Yale than it was to go there and get all the tools that may have made me successful when I was earlier. And so at this point in my career, I don't know if I would go back and, and, and change any of the mistakes I made. Well, I, for writers, there's always the ongoing question of discipline. You know, I always feel like there's more that I wish I could write. Um, I, I made a foray maybe five years ago. I was sort of dabbling in television a little bit and, and, and realized that it wasn't really for me. Uh, but I don't feel like that's wasted time. Now I know that that hosting or producing television probably isn't going to be as core to my career and my life as some of the other kinds of writing that I do. And um, so I guess that's good advice: is embrace your mistakes and don't be afraid or or or, or ashamed of the mistakes you make because those those are your education and that that is your education and the. Um, uh, it's just so much more meaningful to be on a, on a campus now having um, gotten my education through the, hard, the, the School of Hard Knocks and being able to communicate yeah. that to my Yale students than having got something more, more networked and, and received um, when I was younger. Uh, there was another, oh, there was a question about how vagabonding the book itself has changed. It's, it's interesting. I, I read the book myself. I narrated it. Um, Tim asked yeah. me, if I wanted to, and I said, well, you know, I don't know, and he said, well, record yourself and we'll see, and he liked the way my voice sounded. <laughs> and I've done some, I've done some radio before, and so I reread, back in June, I sat in the studio and reread the whole book, um, and it was really fun, because reading it aloud it forced me to engage with those words in a way that I hadn't really engaged with it since I'd written the book. Um, and it was pretty cool, it was pretty cool to go back to it and realize it that, that 99.8% of the advice is exactly the same as when I wrote it. I mean, I think I took out something about using a post de restante office to mail yourself something, and I took out reference <laughs> to CD-ROMs, which um, you know are incredibly ancient, and I may have ad added a few things about social media. Um, but it I was still fun, used you know. Those once or twice in the last couple of years. CD-ROMs. <laughs> There's a theme party, you know, instead of having like a an yeah. LP party or, you know, another type of retro thing, get your CD-ROMs out and look at the Encarta Cyclopedia, do shots. <laughs> um, but but yeah, it was it was fun to uh, it was it was fun to to reencounter those words. And, and it's funny when I was first producing the book, and, and in fact, some of the early reviews were saying. Oh yeah, well, there's this philosophical part, but the but the most important part are these resources that Rolf Potts is giving us. Well, you know, all those resources have changed. I keep them updated online, 
But the yeah. core philosophy is not just what still holds true. It's also what's resonated with people, you know, yeah. that um, links and tips will change, but that those core existential reasons for making the most of your time, um, you know, that's what, you know, that's what um, made the book worth writing. That's what made the, the book true. And so, so 10 years later, it's been exciting. I almost learned by accident um, in revisiting my words. Um, how how effective it still is. So it's it's fun to be to have been able to do that, all that work ten years ago, revisit it now and realize that it's still a really relevant um, book. So that is, yeah, that's really interesting. That ten years later, it's uh, it's it's really held its uh, its own. You know, um, yeah, you know, your your second book, Marco Polo. Mm. Marco Polo didn't go there. Um, what is a postmodern travel writer? What does that mean for you? Well, I talked about that a little bit in the introduction of the book, and postmodern is a problematic word because it's used in different ways in different situations. But what I meant um, to communicate is the idea that more and more travel writing is a, is a two-way conversation. It isn't this old, old process of white men in pith helmets going to a faraway country and writing these definitive works about distant lands. Um, the cover of Marco Polo didn't go there is is a monk taking a picture of his fellow monks sort of mm -hmm. in what looks like the viewfinder of a camera um, and that underscores the idea that I might be telling a story about the people I meet but they have their own view of themselves and that has become more and more a dialogue these days and so you don't as a travel writer you can't just go to a place and write a semi -to true picture postcard of a place uh, that you really have to engage it on its own terms and understand that that place increasingly is going to talk back to you. And so that, that postmodern idea is the idea that um, the conversation is, is being leveled and it's more inclusive now. And if you're not acknowledging that, um, then you're sort of missing, missing the heart of what you should be aiming for as a travel writer. And then also, as you know, in Marco Polo didn't go there, I put end notes at the end of every uh, chapter that are sort of the, um, the uh, behind the scenes look into how each one of those stories was created because you might write a 3,000 word article for a magazine that fits the needs of the magazine, but you know, 120,000 words of experience happen there. So what, which 3,000 words do you choose? And so I really use those endnotes to analyze the craft of writing. And that's sort of a postmodern flourish, too, the idea that the, the, the narrative is contained, but you're going to crack open that narrative and look at, and look at uh, it in a more complex way is sort of a postmodern idea. When, when I spoke to you last, I know we talked about many of the, the writers of the past who I think you admire the most, like Walt Whitman and... Um, Thoreau, and um, mm. I, I was just curious, you know, like, are, who are some of the people who are writing today that you admire most, um, or that you're learning a lot from right now? Um, I've, I've been on a, on a big kick of long-form journalism um, recently, and if you go to longform.org uh, online, you can find, a, you know, a daily, they send like five links a day, they're not all about travel. But it's a really good reportage, and one of the one of the great contemporary long form travel writers is Peter Hessler, uh, who was the New Yorker's correspondent in China for a long time. He's in Cairo now. He wrote a book called um, Rivertown, and another one called Oracle Bones. His new one was called Strange Stones, um, and. He spoke Chinese and he's learning Arabic, and so he's a better man than me. He's he's good at languages, and my reportage has never really involved fluency on my part. Um, but he's able to he's really able to capture stories that go beyond, you know, sort of the the one tone note of news headlines. But it's also not sort of the charming self regarding either. He's really reporting. Um, and he puts himself in the stories a little bit, but he's doing the work to really know what it feels like to be in a small town in China or a factory in China or to be learning how to drive in China or, or to be at a mosque in, in Cairo. So um, he's a good example. Uh, and, and there's, there's other uh, 
journalists like that out there. Um, and more and more, I think that the line between travel and other genres of journalism it isn't always clear. You know, you have somebody who might go to a country to do war journalism and stay in the region and report um, from those countries in those places in a way that evokes travel but isn't necessarily a tourist experience. Um, myself as a travel writer, I sort of write from the perspective of tourism because tourism interests me. And, and in a way, you know, people who go vagabonding aren't journalists or aid workers. They're, they're tourists in their own way. They're vagabonders. And so that psychology interests me. And in fact, I do a lot of reading about the anthropology and sociology of tourism because travelers are, have their own cultural idiosyncrasies. Uh, and it's really fun to, uh, to take a look at those. Um, but yeah, as far as a recommendation goes, um, these long-form journalists of, of the type that uh, of Peter Hessler are hmm. a great place to start. Interesting. Um, and what about, do you, I th I've spoken to you before about a little bit about your process. I think it was our, our, our member, my friend Craig, who was really curious about your writing process. Um, and you did go into depth on that in our past interview with you, but um, more, my interest was like, uh, as an artist, you know, which is what a writer is, as a, as a creator, a producer, do you struggle very, uh, very much, very regularly with staying focused, with staying motivated, fighting the resistance, as Stephen Pressfield calls it, um, is that a struggle for you, and how do you address it? Yeah, every day. <laughs> Uh, every day it's a struggle. It's um, it's a solitary pursuit, <clears throat> and as a writer, I'm a, um, I'm not a big wordsmith. I, I I can't just gush words and words. I'm a sentence by sentence writer. Kurt Kurt Vonnegut said that there's bashers and swoopers, and a swooper will go in and write a lot of words at once, and then revise and revise and revise and revise and revise. I, um, I'm more of a basher. A basher is someone who goes in, and it has to be perfect on the sentence level before you go to the next sentence. I, I, I'm not comfortable swooping in and writing a whole bunch of words. And that creates its own limitations and it requires a high degree of focus. Um, um, if, it's, if it's a very deep kind of writing, it's almost this trance-like focus of writing. And it's hard to achieve that state. Um, travel is actually, I wrote, I wrote some of my favorite stories when I was traveling because when you're in a you know, in, in in a horrible ten dollar hotel room in Laos, you know, you just want to you, you want to stay focused and get your story done, uh, so you can get back out and start traveling again. And that f gave me a kind of discipline, you know, especially in in the pre wireless era. It's so easy to distract yourself. I actually bought the Freedom app so I can cut off my selectively cut off my wireless connection because I, I sort of have a monkey brain. <laughs> which is good creatively to be, you know, your little monkey brain is always looking after new things and picking up sparkly, shiny objects. Um, that's good because I can sort of, I can intellectually go sideways and make, a, make associations because my brain is going in that ways. But it also takes me completely out of that trance zone of writing a story. And so if I'm not focused, it creates problems. One nice thing about being here in Kansas uh, is that it's just quiet. You know, I don't have any distractions. And uh, it's a very productive place for me writing-wise. Less so in, like, Connecticut when I'm teaching at Yale. I'm just so busy and in interacting with students and reading their writing that um, I'm much less efficient. And so I'm a, I'm a horrible example of how to work as a writer. You know, my, my own, <laughs> my own um, you know, method is so unique to myself, and it's, and it's so tortured sometimes where I'll be really frustrated with myself for not being very productive on a given day. Um, but it's, you know, there's nothing that feels quite as good as having written and know that you wrote something good, too. So yeah. um, I, I wouldn't want to do anything else as tortured as, as it can be sometimes. This is where I, I really do feel like there even, I mean, I, I am not a writer in the sense that you're a writer by any means, but I do sometimes consider myself a writer. You know, I'm very comfortable in that format, and um, I enjoy telling stories through that art, you know, um, but uh, more as, you know, a small business person and an, an entrepreneur, I feel that there is, even for folks who are not writers, but um, there's, there's a, a big overlap between 
real entrepreneurs and artists and writers and because it's like you're, you're all creating and uh, we're all fighting that that resistance in whatever sense it manifests itself for us you know um, so it's always interesting to hear yeah how people cope with that and and what drives them and whatnot um, I'm you know, one one person did uh, ask a little bit. They referenced just the ad. They said something about the advent of social media and how it's. I think it's affected both travel and writing quite a bit. Um, so I also wanted to get to you know some of the things you're doing now with your with the audiobook coming out on Audible and some some of the ways you've been promoting recently. Um, I am curious, you know, it, I mean, to me, it strikes me as like you've gotten a lot more entrepreneurial recently, you know, in your writing or in, in, in uh, what you're doing with it, I suppose. Uh, but yeah, I was curious if there's any uh, learnings, you know, that you've had that you would, you could share with people. What, what have you learned from that process, like putting free, releasing free content on BitTorrent and putting together videos and reading the the book yourself and putting together this audio book and a lot of the things you've done. Um, what has that process been like and what have you learned? Well, um, I've learned that Tim Ferriss is a good guy to partner with. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, a lot of the things you mentioned are actually his strategies. I mean, he's really perfected um, the art of bringing the right message to the right people. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, like, you know, BitTorrent, the videos, you know, all that stuff is Tim or the people that Tim is working with. Um, and so I'm not an entrepreneur in, in, in the pure sense or, or in the sense that, that, that you're an entrepreneur, but I think you can't be a freelancer at anything in the 21st century and not have some business instincts. Um, and I think as long as you're hewing close to your tactics and, or, or to your talents, and as long as you're creating, creating something that is somehow tied to your passions, you know, um, if you're just doing playing the widget game because you think you might make money, then even when you do make money, it's not as satisfying as when you are in that creative problem-solving process where you're bringing um, interesting ideas and interesting concepts and interesting products to people. Um, and so um, in my case, it's like I'm almost my own product, you know, or, or, or the, the vagab vagabonding is sort of my brand. Um, and I think I've just, I, I might have a little bit more of a knack for entrepreneurial, you know, for business type stuff than some writers. I mean, I was just, I was an early adopter of having an author website and doing various degrees of blogging and, and online promotion. And, you know, I've, I've interviewed a, a travel writer a month for... 13 years now, and I, I didn't really set out to make that a networking uh, endeavor, but in a way, it, that's sort of what it is. That's is. I've, I've made some great friends and colleagues, and, and we give each other business through that. Mm -hmm. And so I think not being afraid to give things away for free, um, finding something that you love. I mean, you mentioned earlier that I might be tired of talking about vagabonding. I'm actually not. I'm having a great time this week. It's fun to re revisit the issues. And to meet people who had, um, you know, who've had some of the same questions and challenges I had when I was first starting out, or just to meet people who who said they love my book. It's 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 it's. I don't normally have the occasion to to hear back from a ton of people at once, uh, but suddenly because of uh, Reddit or other social media things, there's all these people coming in and saying, "Yeah, I read your book in 2006, and I traveled the world." and met my wife and now we have kids and we're traveling the world and it's like Jesus did I is it really been that long you know uh, so, so that's been fun that's been fun and I think it wouldn't have been fun had I not really been keeping my endeavors close to my heart and I think one of the temptations um, for working writers who aren't as vested in the entrepreneurial world um, is to is to fall back on teaching you know and I know a lot of unhappy writer teachers, you know, they'd rather be writing full time. <coughs> and the reason that they're not is that they didn't risk it. You know, they didn't they didn't allow themselves to be hungry. Um, and I do some teaching because I enjoy teaching. I, I come from a family of teachers. Um, 
but I get the most satisfaction from my, my writing, and I'm, I'm glad that I didn't fall back on the comforts and certainties that come with you know, a, a solid academic position, which I think too many writers seek. Um, it, it's almost like there's entrepreneurial equivalence, you know, for someone in business, it's getting that middle manager position, you know, and not really risking much and, and seeking the stable life and maybe working with somebody else's ideas instead of your own. Well, to an extent, I'm not going to knock it too much. My sister's a professor. Um, but to an extent, academia is the middle level of management of writing, you know, that you're, you're yeah. sacrificing a little bit of your own ambitions and ideas to sort of play in the system. And it's easier and more secure to a certain extent, but it's not always as satisfying. And so um, I'm, I'm happy with the path I took, I think. Yeah, it seems like an interesting uh, a line you walk kind of between those different worlds. Um, that's, that's a good, seems to be a good opportunity you've carved out for yourself. Um, but yeah, that's something I'm fascinated with. You know, I, I love higher education and so on, but yeah, they, they can be drastically different, that path and the path of someone, you know, to, choosing to travel and live unconventionally or choosing to build their own business. Um, you know, as, as such a huge, very visible proponent of, uh, of independent travel, of, of long-term travel, and kind of this different uh, approach to life, I think, you know, do you get a lot of adversity from individuals? Do you, have you experienced very much resistance from people, you know, for, towards your message, your, your mission? I used to. I used to. It, it, it happens less. Um, I, th I think the idea of vagabonding is a little bit more normalized now um, because people can can Google around a bit and see that normal people are doing it. It's not a hippie thing, which, which even in the long-term travel is still seen as a counterculture thing. And there's nothing wrong with the counterculture, but um, normal people need to travel too. Uh, and, and it's funny how success um, at various levels um, sort of deflects naysayers. Um, when, just, when I was just a young Kansas kid traveling around, trying out these new ideas, writing about these new ideas, um, I was more likely to be criticized than when I'm a guy who's written a best-selling book and teaches at a league school and you know is 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 a known quantity. Uh, among uh, you know the, the 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 lifestyle design community, and I've been on television. I've hosted a Travel Channel special. I mean, just all these things are, to an extent, they're sort of superficial legitimizers. You know, why should the fact that I've been on TV or teach at an Ivy League school um, be able to legitimize it? Because you know, there's people who find ways into those places that are not always earned. But people, I don't know, people, people swallow my message a, a lot easier now. Um, possibly because of age and experience and success, but also because it's less of a radical idea, um, the idea of long-term travel. And I like to think that I've contributed to that a little bit because I, in Vagabonding, I, I talk a lot about work, you know, and I talk a lot about earning the freedom to travel and, and how... It doesn't need to be this crazy, rebellious, self-indulgent thing. You know that it's it's actually a very logical thing um, to go vagabonding, and it's and it's in your own self-interest, um, just as a person, to to actualize your dreams while you when you have them. And so I like to think that my argument has seeped into sort of conventional thinking in the last ten years, and and certainly the online world, and the fact that so many people are traveling and blogging and you know, using social media to talk about it is that it's just less of a weird, intimidating, hippy dippy thing. It's it's more of a more of a logical thing, or at least for those people who are listening. Yeah. 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 It's uh it's becoming more natural to us over time, which is nice. Um, okay, one last quick question from an audience member. Um, from Brian Gruber. It relates to what you were just saying, you know, in, in relation to the work, um, and what you've seen. I know you know you're coming to this as a writer, and um, we've talked about teaching, teaching English. But he 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 asked, um, can can you talk about people who move around to sustain themselves practically? 
while being location independent, like he's curious about what are the best areas of for earning opportunity, best emerging models and types of work you've seen. That's something I could go on for for a very long time, but curious for your perspective if there's many things you recommend. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like vagabonding has influenced a lot of um, digital nomad type people. Um, I don't know. Those people, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but those people, of, most of us, right? Um, but those people, by doing it, have outstripped my knowledge of it. You know, I, I think that there's a, a far-flung digital nomad community out there who, just by being vested in that, um, are a lot better qualified to answer that. I mean, I writing and 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 to an extent teaching have been how I've made my living. Um, and I'm still a big fan, as, as, as I mentioned before, of going overseas, teaching in a place like Korea or China or Saudi Arabia or whatever. Um, and so the types, I, I'm not qualified to say the cutting edge of what is the best way to, to sustain a living overseas. You know, I've seen graphic designers, I've seen people doing a lot of IT stuff and, and some self-sustaining entrepreneurial stuff. But that's probably something that, that Tim Ferriss or, or, or even you, really, Cody, would, would be better qualified to answer. Um, and, and one way to do it is not to just take one person's word for it. It's just to dig around online and see what, what's working for people. Yeah. And, and be a little bit critical. Uh, you know, one person, one way to achieve success is to claim that you're successful. <laughs> so if somebody is saying that they're making $120,000 a year off of, you know, <clears throat> selling Chinese figurines on eBay and that allows them to live in Brazil or whatever, you know, practice skepticism and, and, and see. But um, it's almost like market research for any business that you go into is just get out there and, and see what people are doing and, and make connections. And unfortunately, as an established guy, I'm doing less of that. And so um, uh, that, that's something that a, a, lot, a little bit of self-motivated research probably give you a, a better answer than I can give. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Ryan and anyone else, like, um, I mean, you, you, Rolf has a tremendous amount of resources, as I did mention at one point already, but, uh, you know, revisit, yeah, vagabonding.net slash resources, especially. I know you've got tons of things on there. Um, but you can visit us. If you're not already a DNA member who's listening in right now, a lot of you aren't, but uh, you can visit me at digitalnomadacademy.com, or better yet, actually, at Thrilling Heroics, if you haven't, if you if you just came on for Rolf. Um, Check out my blog, and there's all kinds of information there. More about yeah, working from the road and uh, you know building your own business, things along those lines. But I mean, I've I've got tons of friends who, I mean, teaching teaching is a big one. I've got dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of you know English teacher friends and so on. And um, that's one you've talked about quite a bit. It's a good, even even if you don't plan on staying with that, you know, it can be a great kind of stepping stone to. Yeah, a life abroad and finding another job or getting started on your, a project of your own, uh, whatever whatever path you choose to go down. Um, all right, my last question for you, Rolf, if you don't mind answering it real quick, I would just be sure. curious. I know that you probably get asked about you know where you've been and where you really like the best or stuff like that. I know there's no favorites. But which of your epic journeys, you know, like or adventures, will always kind of stick out in your mind as perhaps one of the most um, influential or challenging in your life? Well, um, what popped in my head is that first that van journey around the U.S. In, in in large part because just doing it was a big deal for me. Doing doing just the fact that I that I got behind the wheel of a van and started driving without knowing when I was coming home was yeah. was really essential and it may I've done crazier more exotic more dangerous you know more outrageous journey since then but that was really really influential that first step is often the most important and a lot of vagabonders will tell you that um, so really really that's it I, I you know I also I went down the Mekong in a little Laotian fishing boat for three weeks in 1999 which is something I probably wouldn't do again um, but it was a wonderful trip um, and I think about that sometimes but um, but yeah my easy answer is that that first trip that first vagabonding trip um, 
will always be my favorite because I, I just, I don't know, I, not only did they have fun, but I was just so thankful that I that I was out there. You know, there's something, a lot of vagabonders will tell me this too, that they're so grateful that they did it early on, um, that, it, it, that it's just this really rewarding emotional experience because maybe a lot of people have been telling them they can't do it or maybe they told themselves they can't do it. And then one week, one month, six months in, they realize that it's happening, you know. And so that energy, that that epiphany I had two weeks into my trip in 1994, it's been a while, uh, it's still feeding me. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll always cherish that first vagabonding trip. Yeah, I think it's the same for probably a lot of people who start to live that more as a lifestyle. Like the first one was, it will always stick with you because it was the hardest. It's like just jumping off, you know. Mm, for sure. Um, well, there's an awful lot of uh, feedback and people saying, you know, this has been great and thank you very much. And I'm sorry that we can't address all your comments and questions, guys, but I really do sincerely thank you all for joining us on YouTube and Google Plus and, uh, you know, wherever the heck <laughs> everyone is tuning in. Um, and Rolf, thank you so, so much for making the time to, to join us again. It's really a pleasure to catch up with you. And, um, you know, congratulations on releasing the audiobook version finally, and I, I saw it's doing really well. Um, everyone, you know, if you've not already, uh, there's a, a link with some, a little bit of free, con actually quite a bit of really cool stuff, free content and a sample chapter or two from the book. Uh, if you go to bit.ly, you know, bit.ly, L-Y, slash Rolf Potts, um, I'll post that. If you haven't already seen it, it'll be all over the place after we get off here. But bit.ly slash Rolf Potts, you can get some cool content from Rolf and Tim um, on BitTorrent. And, you know, if you know you want to get the audio book, which I highly recommend, it's one of my, one of the two books, man, that sent me on a very interesting and fun path in life. Um, I, I highly recommend it. Go to audible.com and search for Vagabonding. And, uh, yeah, is there any anywhere else people can find you online, Rolf? Any last words? They can, uh, I'm an old school internet guy, so just go to rolfpots.com. Send me an email at rolf and rolfpots.com, and I'll answer it eventually. Cool. Well, thank you so much for for being here, and it's been really fun to chat with you again. You bet. It's been great talking. Talk to you later. Good luck with everything you've got this week. <laughs> Thanks a lot, man. Take care. See you later, Rolf. Thank you. And, yeah, thank you all for being here. Appreciate it very much. Um, stay tuned, and I'm sure I'll do a lot more of these in the future. So take care, guys. Have a good night or morning or whatever, wherever you are in the world. Bye-bye.